at ASCM, and I am joined today with our CEO, Abe Ashkenazi, and also Yossi Sheffi, who is the director of the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. And today we're going to talk about strategies for building resilience into supply chain. So thanks for joining us, and thank you, Yossi and Abe. Hey, Abe. Thank, thank you for having me. Wonderful. So let's jump right in. Um, so COVID-19 definitely revealed the unfortunate fact that globalized supply chains were very fragile. Um, across nearly every sector, the pandemic became a real-time example of the interconnectedness and complexity of our systems. It's no longer enough to stockpile. Companies discovered the need to be producing and sourcing locally. So Yossi, let's start with you. Do you think localized supply chains are going to be a key to resilience in the future? It's hard to imagine, depending on what you're talking about the future. When we talk about the next five years, I would say no, because it's uh, it takes a lot. The media always misunderstands supply chain in the sense that they look at the final stage of production and say, okay, this you put a label made in China is bad, you put a label made in Vietnam is good. But there's a whole ecosystem of suppliers and their supply and their supply, what we in the profession call, you know, if you think about the bill of material, where stuff is coming from. Companies spend decades and billions of dollars building this across the globe, particularly in China, you know, the issue usually come with respect to China. And the Chinese suppliers are good. They are, they are innovative, they, are, they have capacity, they're very responsive. It's not easy to find these ecosystems mm -hmm. elsewhere, and it's not easy to move them. So in the, what I call medium term, you know, five, even 10 years, I don't see a big move. There will be some. There are companies that already move because of the trade, because of the, uh, increasing cost of, uh, of labor in China. Company moves to China because of labor costs have moved out, especially if you think about, uh, you know, clothing. It's done basically in Sri Lanka, in Bangladesh. It's not done in China anymore. Textile, however, are done in China because this is capital intensive, very sophisticated manufacturing. So I don't see full supply chain moving out. I see sometimes the last stage, the assembly, in, in government, it will be cutting and sewing that's moving out. And even Chinese companies are moving out of China in, uh, uh, in these cases. I don't see a big move of entire supply chain. I see on the margin, yes, but not a big move. So Abe, one of the things we talk about a lot at ASCM is leadership. Um, and obviously the pandemic placed extraordinary demands on supply chain leaders, in particular, you know, they wanted to keep their employees healthy and they also wanted to ensure the continuity of work and continue building resilience when we can rebuild for the future. So what tactics should business leaders be employing right now that will see them through to this new future? Um, I think the first, I think you've uh, hit the nail on the head and that's first on their workforce, um, making sure that they're safe and they're healthy. Uh, the criticality of supply chains, I think, is now clearly understood. As you'll see, is pointing out, while most individuals focus on that last mile or that delivery of a product, the synchronization and harmonization necessary to get that product from a you know raw material or a um, manufacturing process to the end customers, I think, is a clear indication of the leadership necessary and the coordination necessary for supply chains. Among the challenges that a lot of leadership has right now, specifically on workforce, is you know either the De uh, Defense Production Act or the necessity to maintain production in environments, whether they're food production or in the pharma, in capacity that they had not um, either imagined before or considered before, and in work environments that are probably not as conducive to long-term sustainability. So this, that's the first step, the health and the safety of their workforce. And these should be 1A priority individuals. Otherwise, we're going to, we saw the impact of the surge and the shifts in demand in the beginning of the pandemic and uh, the concept of scarcity and uh, the fear that that brings to a lot of individuals. This is a critical aspect of our supply chain is the workforce necessary to produce and to maintain the resources as well as the products necessary for consumers. 
moving on, I think we've got a, uh, a short-term bias, and it's not surprising considering the impact that this pandemic and the uh, resulting impact on supply chains has had. Uh, I think a lot of organizations are mitigating and responding to challenges right now with a little bit less on building and transforming into the future, as Yossi was pointing out. I think there's a lot of medium-term and short-term focus areas that they need to respond to, and then they can start to plan out a little bit further. And this goes to the point of data and the, the, the necessity of qualified, relevant, and timely data to make the decisions. And this has been a problem since the beginning of the pandemic, whether we're talking about surges or the food production or even the vaccine, the data necessary to support a delivery to the last mile into the needles to stick them into the arms has you need the qualified individuals at the table, not only in the design, but in the implementation. I think this has been a little bit of a shortfall um, that we didn't really learn from the beginning of the pandemic. And we're seeing a little bit of the um, recurrence in the vaccine rollout. So, you know, the focus on the employees, the focus on short term, but an eye terms long term and getting the necessary information so that they can make qualified informed decisions is a critical part of responding and enabling organizations to be sustainable out of this uh, pandemic. Let me let me add to it. I think that's in terms of long term, how our organization can think of because the pandemic was not the, the last time that we had big disruption and big changes to supply chain. So let's think about how we vaccinate the organization and make them more resilient, basically. So it, it, there are several industries. One, uh, start thinking twice about long-term commitments mm -hmm. and have a balance between long-term commitments and short-term. I mean, you want to think about trucking. You can go, move for your own fleet to long-term contract, to sport market, to gig. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do you do all of this? How do you get the right uh, balance between the, the short term that may you know, tie you up when there's no demand and, you know, and let's say spot market or, uh, you know, the Airbnb of warehousing, the companies who do that, lots of companies who allow you to flex and go and, and, and go up and down. Next thing I, I would say also, socializing the organization in mm -hmm. terms of what? In terms of when you have your forecast, Make sure that you have the possible high, the possible low, with well, with wide berth, but not only just words. Do the entire planning, the financial planning, the workforce planning for several scenarios. Doing this is most importantly for socializing the organization to think that things may not be as predicted, mm -hmm. which, by the way, usually they're not. So being ready for this, watching for this is, is, is very important. And there are certain steps say that you can do, I'm, I'm not going to go uh, over them, but it's most important to make sure that everybody in the organization think that things may be different. You see, you bring up a really good point about the, um, you know, sort of the, the supply chain professional and his perspective that there isn't a plan, there are multiple plans. And it's a, about the a, scenario planning, they've got to be able to flex appropriately for continuity, for stress testing. And I think too often the supply chain professionals get married to a particular plan and we you know, continue to push forward, even though all the data points are telling you that you need to change. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it, it's a human trait. I mean, it's just that you know, it's hard to change. It's hard to move from, you already plan, you already know that you are doing well in this forecast. And now things are different. Well, maybe you're still going and it may work. But well, wishful thinking does not work well with supply chain decisions. So yep. anyway. So when we talk about that kind of disruption and that kind of sudden change, uh, one thing that we did notice was the digitizing supply chains, supply chains did help build that resilience. Um, and gave people more visibility and they can manage issues as they might arise. So um, what does supply chain's digital future look like and what types of solutions hold the most promise? I'll give that one to Yossi. Uh, okay. Um, first of all, let's talk about the biggest uh, change is who ever heard about Zoom before the pandemic? I mean, <laughs> we start all kind of communication the platform that we are doing right now, I never heard about it. Uh, so it's a, all these things um, 
you know, communication improve. And, but this is in a particular area, it will leave a lasting and good impact. That's one of the good things that will come out of the, of the pandemic is telehealth. The question that people in far French, you know, part of the world can now have access to first rate medical advice, to first rate medical diagnostic. If you marry this with drones that can uh, um, bring medicine already working in, in, in Africa and Australia and, and a lot of countries, I think there will be a good step function because of you know digital communication during the pandemic, there'll be a step function going forward in, in healthcare around the world. So this is something we talk about uh, digitization. I usually don't like to talk about digitization in general. I like to talk about solving specific problems because some of them may be solved with digital uh, tool and some maybe it's not, it's not the right thing. So I don't like, you know, I went, I'm sure Abe and every professional is over 50 years old, uh, went on uh, the state, people were going to China and boards were asking the CEO, what's your China strategy? Instead of asking, how do you lower costs? How do you get better product? What's your China strategy? So now it's not, what's your digitization strategy? I'd like to think that people should think about the problem that you're trying to solve. You want to understand better where your stuff is coming from. You want visibility. You want transparency. There are certain things that you want, you want to do omnichannel. You, there are certain things that you want to do for which there are solutions. There are technological solutions. Some of them is process solution, unnecessary technology. So you have, I, I would like to think rather than digitization, I would like to think about what problems we are trying to solve. Uh, and then think about digital technology or process solution. So you mentioned telehealth as something positive that came out of yes. the pandemic. Um, so, you know, they do say that disaster can be a you know, leading to interesting inventions. So, um, Abe, what are some other, you know, silver linings that you see? Um, I, I want to amplify, uh, the, the, you know, Yossi's comments were, um, first, uh, transparency and visibility uh, with the digital supply networks is, uh, you know, just exploded exponentially for organizations. It, it's not a question of data. It's a question of being able to analyze and understand the data and use it. And I think this is one of the areas that we've had a little bit of a problem with in terms of our talent development is that critical thinking in terms of being able to discern what the information is telling you so that you can make an informed decision. So the digital supply networks and digital networks are genning up all kinds of content right now and information. You need those qualified individuals to be able to discern which is the appropriate path to take based on the information that you receive. That's you know obviously a critical part of this. But then when we start talking about, you know, moving forward with the what used to be a very linear process for supply chains has become a very integrated process enabled by technology, enabled by visibility and transparency. So our work with Deloitte on the digital supply networks has started to, you know, embrace the concept that it's not a sequential um, activity for supply chain. It's an integrated matrix of supply chain. And to Yossi's point, um, it, it's not a one size fits all. Your China strategy is not going to be consistent for your South America strategy. So uh, again, being able to uh, have the agility and the flexibility to respond to the different markets based on the demand and the need for those particular markets is starting to gen up different supply networks. And so the flexibility and availability that digital networks have enabled with supply chain professionals, I think has only accelerated because of the pandemic. Uh, digitization was there before the pandemic. It's now accelerated because of it. I, I want to add one more thing about digitization that's important in general. And this is having more and more than one version of the truth. What we have in many cases is people in different functions in the same organization do things that hurt another function. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are many, many, you know, funny and not so funny cases of this. And the question is, how do you make sure that everybody works with the same information and, and how silos, you know, in many cases, people feel information is power, the ogre information mm -hmm. rather than share it across the organization. There are tools to share information across the organization because most of the time, people are not trying to do the wrong thing. They just operate from different set of data, different different information. And we have to make sure the entire organization, if you talk about 
one area of digitization is making sure there's one version of the truth and actually propagate it even beyond the uh, the wall of the company, but uh, first of all, within the company. And by the way, let me just uh, say hello to somebody who's obviously there's a Gary Smith person on the chat who made, who made a very, very profound comment. He said, I really enjoy Yossi's latest book, The New Abnormal. <laughs> so Gary is, of course, a smart and informed guy. Gary's a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for our last question, the question that's on many, many people's minds, what is it going to take to vaccinate billions of people? And how do supply chains play a role in this? What can we do to help? Uh, sorry, I'll give this one to Abe. Uh, this is, I think we can spend a considerable amount of time on this, and I think Yossi has quite a bit to share on this as well. Um, first is, get the professionals in the room. I, I think we had that same concept when we had the beginning of the pandemic, get the scientists, get the doctors in the room, and going back to Yossi's point, let's agree on the facts. Let's agree on what the issues are first, and then discern or determine what the appropriate path to take knowing that we're going to fail, knowing we're going to learn, and we're going to adapt and adapt and implement again. But first is get the qualified individuals into the room. Second, Operation Warp Speed was an extraordinary success uh, beyond any um, medical um, metrics that you can ever establish. The speed with which they developed the vaccine is an extraordinary accomplishment. The unfortunate part is that we didn't spend the same amount of time or at the same time develop the last mile delivery, which Riosi was pointing out before, which was what most people are looking at is how do we get it in the arms? And so therefore the coordination, as we talked about in the beginning of knowing what your demand is, knowing what your capacity for manufacturing is, your logistics, your distribution, your last mile, getting it into the arms with the necessary cold storage, all of these activities are consistent with what supply chain professionals do. There's nothing really new about this. It's just a matter of putting a plan together that starts at the highest level of the organization. Going back to Yossi's point, you can't deal with alternative facts or different facts for 50 states determining what their priority is relative to the global or national or a global issue. So th that's part of the challenge here. Lastly, uh, I think you need to understand that data. Let's identify what we're trying to do and how quickly we're trying to do it. And then you back up into the manufacturing process. This is a, this is not a unique problem. Uh, the challenge that we had is uh, getting the right individuals into the room to make the necessary decisions to enable us to treat and va you know, vaccinate the world. Well, Abe, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, here in North Carolina, the last mile is literally the NASCAR track, which is where my parents got back. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, sorry, oh, Etsy, please. No, I just wanted to add actually to what uh, Abe said that uh, this is this is what we do. This is an SNOP process. This is you know fine, you know, equilibrate demand and supply. We do it day in and day out. You know, and the plan for it. Understand understand in, in this particular system, interesting constraint, like you take something off the of the cold storage, you sometimes have only six hours to do it, which only means that you have to have enough people. So you have the demand and you have to know ahead of time how many of them decide not to take it. So don't just uh, go there, but look at all of these things and get a plan. It, 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 it sounds actually, for a logistics professional, it sounds like that's what we do. Yet, I know in Massachusetts, for example, and by the way, it started with the federal government, there were no logistics professionals in the whole process. You didn't see somebody who is in charge. In Massachusetts, there's a, which I'm familiar with, there's a committee decide on all the, uh, uh, on how to do it. It's doctors, and I understand you need doctors, but you also need logistics professionals because that's what they do. But they're getting slowly better. And I want to add to that, um, there are, as we start talking about vaccinating the world, I think we have to recognize that there are significant challenges for underserved populations and underserved regions across the globe that generally do not have access to qualified health care um, in a traditional sense. So uh, I think we need to embrace that there are going to be challenges in uh, completing the vaccination further as we're seeing gaps in delivery and in the you know the the supply 
it gives rise to counterfeit opportunities for nefarious actors. So we've got to be attuned to this issue as we start to expand the distribution beyond our local um, areas into a, you know, an international or a global um, implementation here. Um, finally, this is a global issue. Now, as much as we'd like to think that this is a local issue and getting individuals vaccinated, this is a global issue. And I think part of the challenge that we have is um, not only on a national level, but on a global level is coordination and getting this resolved because th this type of disruption is not unique to any particular area. It is pervasive. And I think we've got to have a much broader conversation about you know, um, consistency and accessibility in regions and in populations that have been traditionally underserved. Let me, let me add something to this, because we tend to think about underserved population as an equity issue. It's not. I mean, or it's a second order. We are in an unbelievable race against mutations. Yeah. The minute there will be a mutation that does not respond to the current, uh, uh, and, and, and let me just explain that virus always mutates. You get into, the, into somebody's body, it's billions of billions of billions of, of replication, and there are mistakes in the replication in the, uh, in the uh, uh, genetic buildup of, 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 of new viruses. These are the mutations. There are thousands of them. Some of them become dominant, like the UK, the South Africa, now the Brazilian uh, uh, variety, and they have somewhat different, uh, different characteristics. It looks like we still didn't have one that's completely oblivious to the current to the current vaccination. But once we'll have such such one, and it can be anywhere in the world, it doesn't matter. That's the point. It doesn't have to be in the United States. It can be in in, in you know in the bowels of Africa. It doesn't matter. Then it will start again, and we'll have COVID twenty and COVID twenty one and COVID twenty two, and we'll be right back in February of uh, of twenty twenty. So it's in our interest to get the entire world vaccinated, even if people don't care about equity and, and all the other considerations that uh, Abe mentioned. I think there's a parallel discussion that needs to be brought up too, Beth, and that is the, in dealing with the infection rate and the vaccination and parallel tracks with the same providers. We have an acute problem in terms of infection rate and in terms of positivity, and the hospitals are being overwhelmed. And so we've got to consider alternate sites vaccination points where we don't have to bring healthy individuals into a potentially um, health risk environment. So we've got to find different ways to get higher throughput. This goes back to the original question, though. You get the supply chain professionals into the room and they can design the necessary processes and activities as well as locations to be able to deliver this, whether it's hospitals, clinics, pharmas, stadiums, convention centers, high throughput locations. There are ways to get this done. This is not an insurmountable activity. It is very consistent with what Yossi was pointing out before in sales and operations planning. This is part of the fundamentals. Yep. All right, on that note, thank you so much, Abe and Yossi, and thanks to everyone. I'm watching the chat, people all over the world, so great to have you here. And uh, keep an eye on ASCM's LinkedIn channel for more of these LinkedIn Live events. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Beth. Yep. Thank you.